Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good day. Uh, Daisy is here to help me. This is a good thing. I got a notice about a half hour ago saying that I was going to have to run into Milwaukee again on Monday, which means that uh, I'm missing. I have to leave at about noon. I will miss the Monday night class. Good news, bad news, good news is that you don't have to be here on Monday. You already know that because I'm going to send you an email in about, uh, what about, an hour and a half to let you know. But this recording is what you need to have for that class. So you need to watch this recording. As we've done in the past, at the end of the um, uh, lecture, I'm going to ask you to give me a daily quiz. Now you can be listening to this recording anywhere, in the library, at your home, wherever, but I still want you to come to my office and drop off the answer to the daily quiz sheet and just put it in my red chair in my office. And when I see that, then I will pull it up, and that counts as your attendance. If I don't have the daily quiz, then there's no attendance. But you don't get the daily quiz question until we get to the end of the um, uh, lecture today. So today, we're gonna talk about ending the Cold War. I've talked about this over and over again, and so um, I'm not going to spend too much time on what the Cold War was, but as a general concept, you understand that it's really between two different worldviews, two different ways of looking at the world. You have the rule of law, and you have the rule by might. And the United States and England and France and all the, uh, basically you would call the free countries, mainly European, but there are others, lots of others that are not European. A lot of it. Australia would be a perfect example. Um, we'll talk about the other that are, that are not first world countries. But they are not in an actual direct fight with the rule by might. And the rule by might mostly is going to be from the Soviet Union. We're going to have a China. Uh, they're going to split by the late 50s, it doesn't matter. Um, no, the Korea will be a Soviet satellite. Um, the satellites would be the best way of looking at it. Ruska made the comment on last class that these satellites were not voluntary. They were like hostages to some extent. They had no choice. In some cases they did, in others they did not. Uh, Yugoslavia, for example, was a satellite. The dictator in Yugoslavia wanted to be a communist. Uh, Korea. Uh, was pushed through, you'd say that North Korean leadership was certainly on board with what the Soviets and the Chinese were doing, but not the rest of Korea, which is why we have a division, North and South Korea. The point is, is that we've got two different views of the world, and the conflict of the Cold War was not fought between the two. And the reason why it wasn't fought between the two, and you guys have said this before, is because they both have nuclear weapons. And so if you have a direct uh, fight between the free and the unfree, then you're going to have a massive, massive, deadly war. And that, that defeats the purpose, aside from the fact that it's just, just too costly. What, well, what that means, is if you look at the cost-benefit analysis, and this sounds silly when we're talking about war, except if you are on the rule by might, that's all that you do, is the cost, the price that you pay for the war higher than the benefits you might receive. If that's the case, and this is a may receive, you're hoping to receive, if the costs are higher than the benefits, you have no war, okay? That would be no war. But if the price was lower than the benefits, then you'd have war. And even in a rule by mind scenario, this is kind of the way wars were looked at all the way in the middle, um, during the uh, uh, modern European era, up until World War II. World War I was based off of this idea. All of the, um, the Allies and the um, Axis power, Central Powers, they, they, they all thought that they could win this war super quick, quickly. Otherwise, they wouldn't have gotten into the war. After World War II, with the advent of nuclear weapons, that price is so high 
the cost of the war is going to be so high that there's no benefit to it. And so we can't have a direct war between each other. There's a term that I'm going to introduce now. It's called deterrence. And I think I'm spelling this right, but I'm going to bet money that I'm probably not. Deterrence. I don't know that there's two R's in it. What it means is to deter war is to avoid war. And nuclear deterrence means that because the price of the war is so high, you don't go into it. So you deter war. It's to prevent the war from happening before it happens. So nuclear deterrence is a concept that's new after World War II. It's one of the reasons why we have peace in Europe, I don't know, the last 75 years. The price of war would simply be too high. And because of that, the Cold War isn't fought directly between these two powers. Instead, the Cold War is fought over this group called the Third World. And the Third World is a term you guys have heard before. In plain language, it really refers to the non-industrialized powers. And if we want to be even more obvious, um, more direct, we could say these are the former colonies and, because not everybody in the world was colonized, actually just a small portion of it, former colonies and indigenous nations. Indigenous, that means native, right? Indigenous nations. So former colonies and indigenous nations. After World War II, because of the Atlantic Charter, the United States, remember this was the uh, charter that we agreed with in 1941, before the United States even got into the war, it's kind of the mission, the purpose of the war. The United States, and England and France, the free countries agreed to decolonize. Decolonize. And because of that, that meant that the indigenous populations will create their own governments. And I don't know if you remember, we talked about this a long time ago, maybe a couple of weeks ago. This process, in a perfect world, this process is very difficult. In a perfect world, this process is difficult. India was not a perfect world, but pretty close. England was in India. After World War II, England voluntarily left. The Indians didn't have to fight them, didn't have to blow things up. The English voluntarily left. India was England's largest colony. They voluntarily left. And as soon as England left, India erupted into a civil war, just like that. And it lasted four years. And part of the reason why is that the order that existed in that colony was based on the fact that the European government had lots of modern constitutionalism, modern technology, modern industrialization, and it was kind of supporting the order. As soon as you remove that, then the indigenous populations were having to fend for themselves. And they're not helpless, but they didn't have a consensus. And so factions immediately started fighting. In India, it was the Muslims versus the Hindus. And they fought enough that the Muslims went into Pakistan, India became Hindu, and that's what they resolved after four years. That's the best of situations, and it was hard. What about places like Vietnam, or Korea, or some of the uh, Southeast Asian countries, or countries in the Middle East, or countries in Africa, or countries in South America? They all have a difficult time. And so the Cold War is really fought over the influence as soon as the European countries were leaving, and the direction is not to take over, but to decolonize. So they are leaving. The European countries are leaving. There is an instant threat that the unfree communist countries are going to go in. And 
so the West had to figure out a solution. This is kind of very much like what we were talking about with the Philippines after the Spanish-American War. We freed the Philippines from um, the Spanish, but what are we going to do afterwards? We don't want to be there, but if we leave, either Germany or Japan is going to come in. So we ended up holding it for a little bit until the Philippines could come up with its own government and then we could leave. Well, nobody wants to stay in these colonies because we are decolonizing. And so we're trying to come up with a difficulty. What it means then is that decolonization process takes about 25 to 30 years. Some places are very quick, some places are not. And throughout the whole process, we're having this conflict. As the European, as the free countries are leaving, the uh, communist countries are coming in. And so that's why you have this reference. Sometimes you hear about communist rebels. That is who are coming in. That is how the uh, rule by might comes into an area. Okay, so this is just an overview of what the Cold War is, and then I'm done with that. I'm not really going to talk too much about it. Because today the question is how to end the Cold War. Cold War, unlike World War I, World War II, because there's no direct fighting, it's not a three year war or a four year war or a five year war. The Cold War begins right around 1947, and it does not end officially until 1991. So us people that are slow in math, we're looking at this as, uh, what, 44 years? Am I wrong on that? 50, yeah, 44 years. So that's how long the Cold War is. Now I'm going to ask you at the end of this question, I'm going to ask you, is the Cold War over? And you're going to tell me if it is or not. Okay, so that's about all I'm going to use for the... Um, um, Smart board. I'll take two seconds so that you can see the smart board real quick. I understand that you only see parts of it on the video, so let me just show it to you uh, for you guys that are watching this on video. Daisy gets to see it straight up. So this is the picture that I took. You can uh, freeze the video if you want to, take a look at what I was saying. But now I'm going to go back, and the rest of the um, lecture is actually going to be focused on the PowerPoint slides. So it won't be too difficult, but give me a second while this computer thinks. shift back and now we're going to go into the car farm. Okay, so this is a funny thing. I don't know if it's funny. I keep using that word. Uh, Ronald Reagan died in the uh, 2000s. I can't remember what the year was. Maybe 2004 or 5 or whatever. When he dies, this was one of the political cartoons. And it talks about Ronald Reagan and with him buried the Cold War, the Berlin Wall, and the Soviet Union. And it was just kind of a, a um, I don't know, a tribute would be the best way to describe it, that it was Reagan who was responsible for ending these things. And to some extent, that's true, except that very shortly thereafter, I'm thinking within a year or two, um, Pope John Paul II also died. And when he died, they also credited Pope John Paul II with ending the Cold War. Not necessarily with having any impact on the Berlin Wall, but having great deal of impact on the Soviet Union. The fall of the Soviet Union and the Cold War are kind of entwined. And so often, Reagan and Pope John Paul II are kind of credited with ending the Cold War. Well, how can this be? Aside from the fact that the Pope is a Catholic leader, has no military whatsoever. In fact, the Catholic Church kind of takes pride in not having a military. It's never had a military for 2,000 years. And here, the American uh, a leader, president, he's not Catholic. There's no uh, Catholicism. He's Christian, but he's not Catholic. He, you can understand how the United States could have a role in ending the Cold War, but it doesn't make sense. It's not easily intuitive to figure out how both of them. So we're going to talk about that. So in order to do this, we've got to go back in time quite a bit. Now, in fact, before I even start on the Cold War, I just want to cover one loose end. I don't know if you guys remember uh, yesterday, we went over all these questions. I want to make sure that these are basic questions of literacy. You have to be able to understand these questions of literacy. And when we came up to what was the Bay of Pigs and the Cuban Missile Crisis, 
I said, well, I'll talk about that later. Well, this is the time later that we're going to talk about it. Because these are connected to the Cold War, but they also refer to um, kind of how the United States was managing the foreign policy related to the Cold War. Um, it's a little more complicated than that, but I'll, I'll just give you the hint. You know, um, when we first talked about this last unit, the Cold War policy, generically, generally speaking, is containment. You contain the Soviet Union, contain communism, so that it does not spread. It does not put its influence in these third world countries that are having to uh, fend for themselves. That's the idea of containment. That concept comes back all the way in 1936 when FDR is, is uh, urging the League of Nations to quarantine Hitler and Mussolini. It's the same concept. Now, now FDR is doing it um, um, during the war to try to defeat uh, uh, on, uh, Hitler. He dies. Truman takes over and he applies the same basic policy with the rising Cold War that emerges in 47, 1947-48. Bay of Pigs and the Cuban Missile Crisis are two little tactics, two little like fronts within the Cold War. They both reflect containment as a policy, but there's also a, a, a more of a um, underlying tactic with the Cold War that we haven't talked about very much that we will, and it has to do with nuclear deterrence. Nuclear deterrence. This is that thing that's in the back of my mind saying if we actually have a war directly between two superpowers, if the United States and England and France and Germany, if they all fight with the Soviet Union and all of its satellites, we're going to have this catastrophic uh, a war that will make World War II look like nothing. And so we don't want that. We want to do everything we can to avoid that. And since we're doing everything we can to avoid that, we actually maintain peace. And this is kind of a strategy that develops in the Cold War. It's called mutually assured destruction. I'm betting money that when you were in high school, you guys heard this at some point, mad, mutually assured destruction. That's what this policy is, and I'll talk a little bit more about it in about 10 to 15 minutes. But let me talk first about Bay of Pigs and Cuban Missile Crisis, because you guys have heard these, but maybe you don't know what it is. I'll deal with that in a second. Uh, JFK is the president right after Eisenhower. Eisenhower was a general. We talked about this. He's a general in charge of the D-Day invasions in 1944. He is really the one that, from a military command, uh, helped to organize the end of World War II. So in 52, everybody is voting for Eisenhower and very strong support. Um, he doesn't change very much. He's not a very political guy. He's only a military guy. He is a Republican. He has Republican ideals, especially in terms of civil rights. But he doesn't do a lot to turn back the FDR's um, kind of a, a, a activity um, act activism, federal activism. The definition of reform as being action rather than restraint. He doesn't really push any of that back. So he's not that much different than FDR in terms of his domestic policies, except that he's also very proactive on civil rights. Beyond that, he's just Eisenhower maintaining most of what had happened in the 30s and the 40s. When Kennedy comes in, Kennedy is younger. He's not a military guy. It's right before he arrives that he has his first major foreign policy crisis. In 1959, 59 would have been about a year and a half before Eisenhower leaves the office. So Eisenhower is president. Cuba has a revolution. Cuba is an example of one of these third world countries. It was not a colony. And so just because we have decolonization, this isn't limited to former colonies. In some cases, you have indigenous nation states. So Cuba is, is an indigenous nation state. The last time Cuba had a revolution was when they pushed out the Spanish. And the United States helped them to do that. But after the Spanish-American War, remember, we came home. We did not take Cuba. So Cuba was not us. We had very friendly relationships, but Cuba basically managed its own affairs. And it, it, 
wasn't always the best of, um, of efficiency, and we didn't have a perfect democracy there, but it wasn't an American satellite. The United States really had very little influence in Cuba, except that we had a strong trade connection. But Cuba was left to itself. In 1959, after a couple of years, the Soviets had instigated a rebellion. And so they had a guy named Fidel Castro, who was trained by Soviets. And he had um, another guy who is, uh, I don't know if I have his name here, but his name is Che Guevara. And the only reason why <laughs> you should know his name is that he became really popular. Let's see if I have a picture of him. I don't have a picture of him. Very popular in the 80s because he's kind of a handsome guy. He, Che, they actually had a couple movies about him lately. And he's almost uh, portrayed as this hero, uh, driving around South America on a motorcycle. He's kind of like a you know college kid. Um, he he uh, developed kind of a romantic uh, personality. The, the truth is that Che Guevara is a, a really bad guy, responsible for murdering probably tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of people. Uh, the communist revolution was a communist revolution. They took the country by force. They immediately got rid of all the religious um, uh, apparatus. So they killed just thousands and thousands of priests. They arrested anybody who was against uh, and opposed them. It was an actual revolution. And Cuba, if you remember, is 80 miles south of Key West, Florida. It's just south of our border. This revolution happened in the United States didn't do anything. This was a perfect example of the Soviet Union getting right in our backyard. And this wasn't accidental. It was deliberate because it was right in our backyard. Now, Eisenhower is a general. And typically, he's actually a bit cautious. So he was watching what was happening in, England, in, uh, in Cuba, but he didn't have immediate response. He didn't want to immediately go in there and interfere because this might bring about a war. It might bring about a war with the Soviet Union. It might bring about a war with other folks. So he just waited. So he's waiting and watching what's happening with the Fidel Castro revolution. He is hoping that the Cubans themselves will kind of overthrow those who overthrew. So he's cautious. Well, Eisenhower leaves, and in 1960, JFK comes in. And he's a younger guy, 41 years old. He's not, he, he, he was in the military, he was a, um, a Navy boat commander in World War II, so he's got some military experience, but he's not a general. And so for him, this was an opportunity to try to push the Soviets back. When he gets in, he immediately comes up with all sorts of plans. Some of the plans are maybe to assassinate Castro, but the United States never likes assassination. I know it's very popular in movies, but it's not an American policy for the most part. And so he, they played with these ideas, but then in the, in the end they said, that's not the path that we're gonna do. So instead, what they chose to do is to equip the rebels who were against Castro. The, um, what you would say, the old, the folks that were there before. When Castro came in, those that were not uh, killed or arrested fled the country and they moved across into South America. So what the Americans did, the CIA, is they gave weapons and training to these people that were outside of Cuba and said, okay, you go back into Cuba with our weapons and training, we'll give you support, and you can overthrow Castro. They were going to land in the Bay of Pigs. The only problem with this is that Kennedy wanted to help those folks, but like Eisenhower, at the last moment, he got a bit cautious. And the cautious meant that he was going to help them, give them supplies, but when they landed, he wouldn't do anything else. The American troops were not going to land beside them. We didn't have any air support. We didn't actually physically have any presence. And so the Bay of Pigs is when those people that were ousted from Cuba land back into Cuba and try to retake the island. And unfortunately, Cuba's um, uh, dictator, Castro, had a ton of Soviet support and a ton of Soviet military equipment. And so when they landed, any time you try to land on an island, you've got a disadvantage, they were just picking them off left and right. The goal was that as soon as these people
people land, all the people that are in Cuba that hate Castro will rise up and overthrow Cuba. Well, the people that are in Cuba under Castro are afraid literally to be killed. So they don't do anything when the Bay of Pigs uh, lands. And so it becomes a big disaster, a, a huge embarrassment to FDR, I mean, excuse me, JFK. The Bay of Pigs is usually used today as a synonym for a disaster, a miscalculation, an idea that went wrong. Now, we remember that, but only a little bit. Most of the Cold War is fought with this threat of deterrence. And what that means is that a lot of it has to do with a gamble. If I cross this line, is the other side going to fight me? If I can do it and he doesn't fight me, then I'm going to cross that line. But if this line is something that if I cross, they are absolutely going to get into war, then I won't cross the line. That's the term. If we go way back in the beginning of the Cold War, and we're talking about the Berlin Airlift, that's the start of the Cold War. The Soviet Union said, West Germany is in Germany, this is our eastern half here, I'm sorry, yeah, the West Berlin is in East Germany, that's our territory, we are no longer going to allow you to put supplies there. They are crossing a line saying, we are going to take all of Berlin. And then the question is, what is the West going to do? The West had the option of immediately attacking, but nobody wanted to do that. Or they had the option, like other people, to do nothing. This is what they did to Hitler throughout most of the 30s. What the Soviets didn't expect is that the West would do something in between. And that was the Berlin Airlift. So the Soviet Union says, I'm going to take West Berlin. And the West says, we are going to put food there whether you want us to or not. We're going to fly in and airdrop supplies to West Berlin. If you shoot us down, that will be war. And by doing that, the West put their own line and threatened, or actually kind of told the Soviets, if you cross it, we'll have war. And in the end, the Soviets believed the West. So they did not cross the line, and from that point on, um, uh, West Berlin remained allied free soil, even though it is in East Germany. And it has to do with, do you believe that if I cross this line, I'm going to have them uh, respond? Well, the Bay of Pigs is very important because the Soviet Union kind of crossed the line into the Western Hemisphere. The Soviet Union went into Cuba, 80 miles south of the United States. They went into Cuba, they overthrew the government, they put their own guy, Fidel Castro, there, and the United States didn't do anything about it. More importantly, after JFK comes in here and he tries to launch this failed Bay of Pigs invasion, the Soviets begin to think that the Americans can't do anything about it. And so not only do they cross that line, but they create and cross another line. And immediately, the failure of the Bay of Pigs prompts the Soviet Union to be more aggressive in the Cold War. And they do two things. Number one, that little spot of Berlin, and it has nothing to do with Cuba, it's in Berlin, it's in Germany, that little part of West Berlin that only had barbed wire around it since 1947, in 1961, after the Bay of Pigs invasion, the Soviets build a wall around that. And basically what they're telling the West is that you can't do anything. You will never get this back. It will always be kind of a jail sale. You can come in and do supplies all you want, but this wall is permanent. It's a permanent fixture. It's a symbolic gesture. That's when the wall was built. We call it the Berlin Wall Crisis because it's the Soviet Union kind of pushing a little bit in Europe. And JFK responds by going over to Berlin, standing right beside this wall and saying, Soviet Union, I am a Berliner. The famous words, ich bin ein Berliner. 
I am a Berliner. I am Berlin. So you may put the wall around Berlin, but Berlin, don't worry, you are not alone. The West, the United States, will defend you. Soviet Union will never take you. They may threaten, but they won't take you. So the Soviet Union crosses this line by building the wall, and the United States stands up and says, don't go one step further. Don't try to take it. The second thing that the Soviet Union does, and this is the big one that people remember, is that not only do they build the wall, but they also start sending, uh, making plans to send nuclear missiles in Cuba, 80 miles south. This was a line that they figured if we can do that, then we can threaten the United States directly, 80 miles south. At this time, in 1961, Soviet Union did not have intercontinental missiles. You could not fire something from Moscow and have it hit the United States. But if they were stationed in Cuba, they could hit the United States. And so this was a direct threat on American security. So he crossed the line saying, we're going to build this. This picture here is a satellite photo that we have in 1962 that shows that they're actually setting up silos to build missiles. The next thing that remains is for the missiles to go there. When the United States finds this out, JFK tells the United States, tells the Soviet Union, if you cross this line, if you actually put missiles there, we will fight. This will result in war. Are the benefits that you're seeking going to be worth the price of war? This became a major conflict, 10 days, very, uh, lots of movies associated with This is what the Cuban Missile Crisis is. JFK says, that line you cannot cross. So the Soviet had to decide whether or not JFK was bluffing or whether he really was going to pull the trigger on this. And in the end, the Soviets figured that he was not bluffing he backed, they backed down and they, they did not put the missiles in Cuba. They were removed. And so that's what the Cuban Missile Crisis is. This actually made JFK wildly popular. The irony is, is that the Bay of Pigs made him seem like he's a bit of a failure in foreign policy. And this Bay of Pigs caused both Berlin and Cuba. And Kennedy's reaction, both to Berlin and Cuba, made him look like a strong leader. And so actually made him very popular. These wouldn't have happened if he hadn't have failed with Bay of Pigs. The Cold War is a series of these little things where there's a line, you push that line, and you want to see, is the other one going to fall? Is, it, is the other one going to respond, or are they not going to respond? If I have a belief that the other side is not going to do anything, then I'm going to do it. I'm going to take as much as I can get. It's like the little kid in the grocery store. If I can take a little grape and nobody says anything, then I'm going to take that little grape. If I take the candy bar and no one says anything, then I'm going to take the candy bar. And if I can do that, then I might start taking loads of candy bar and then boom, I'm caught in a, in a, a shoplifter. If you try to get as much as you can without getting caught, but if you think that I'm going to get caught the first time, I'm not going to violate that rule the first time. I'm not going to touch the candy bar if there's cameras everywhere. I'm not going to touch the camera bar if the security guard is looking at me. And so I, I don't do it. And that's kind of what we see with the Cold War. That's why the confidence of the leader was so important during the Cold War. If the leader appeared strong, then that would deter the Soviets from acting. If the leader appeared weak, then the Soviets would advance. And we saw that frequently. Okay, that was Bay of Pigs, Berlin. I'm going to shift off. Nixon's administration. Um, all I got to say about the Cold War is that it was during Nixon administration that China and the Soviet Union were really dealt with as two separate powers. They cooperated in terms of Vietnam, 
But as I mentioned, 10 years earlier, in the late 50s, China and Soviet Union had broken away. And so what the United States began to do with uh, Nixon is that we started dealing with China directly, unconnected with the Soviet Union. We call it opening China. We started having trade contacts with China. Prior to this, China was completely closed off. Nobody went in or went out. Soviet Union was completely closed off. But the United States, we, went, we had a visit in China. We opened up. We had some trade talks. And that basically created a triangulation where the Soviets and the China, who already don't like each other, begin to mistrust each other more because they're not sure who's going to do a deal with the United States. So to this extent, um, Nixon is looked at as someone who's really doing a lot to help promote a kind of strong image for the United States. After Nixon, we get Carter. Well, we got four, but he's only in there for a little bit. And then Carter. Carter was seen as someone who actually was fairly weak on foreign policy. And he did this through a number of things. He, uh, the United States built the Panama Canal. We had a 99-year lease on it. This was in the 1890s. When it comes up, getting ready to come to the end of the lease, Carter made the decision to give up the Panama Canal. And, and it would not be leased by the United States anymore. It wouldn't be controlled by the United States anymore. The Panama Canal is that little river that uh, we made uh, to separate North and South America. So that instead of going all the way around South America, you just go through that canal and you have quicker transportation. It's a vital strategic importance as well as a trade importance. For the United States to say, well, we don't want to do that. We want Panama to do this all by itself and we're just going to move away, looks like the United States is just not going to be in, um, worried about these third uh, world countries that might have other influence in it. And so after this, there was an immediate rise of communist activity in other countries throughout Latin America. At the same time, we had another kind of a difficulty. Soviet Union advanced into Afghanistan, and Jimmy Carter's response was to not do anything at all. This is an example where the Soviet Union goes in the Middle East, there's a line, they cross, and the U.S. has no response, which means that I can cross that line, maybe I can cross another line. The last thing was in Iran. There was a revolution in Iran. Iran did not used to be as totalitarian and radical as it is today. Prior to the uh, revolution, Iran was just a, a, it was a third world country, was non-industrialized, but it was relatively friendly to the West. After the Iranian uh, revolution, during the process, they overthrew the uh, leadership, and in the process, they captured the American embassy and took all the occupants hostage. This is, in all other situations, an act of war. And Jimmy Carter did nothing about the hostage. We called it a hostage crisis. They were kept as hostages for more than a year. And it was very embarrassing for Carter. It made the United States look weak. And as a result, then we see the Soviets kind of expanding throughout the world. This caused a great deal of reaction at home. Not only did the Republicans um, uh, um, uh, challenge Carter, but even many Democrats within his own party began to challenge Carter, saying, you need to stand up, you need to step up, we need to do something. In 1980, Reagan wins the election, Pro uh, President Ronald Reagan, and he wins on a wave of reactions on lots of different fronts. Reaction against Carter, appeasement basically means Carter's appearance of being weak. The fact that it looks like he's not strong enough and it allows the Soviet Union to expand. It's a reaction against the econo economic recession. During uh, Carter's years, the uh, um, unemployment went really high. Interest rates went really high. And inflation went really high. But wages went really down. It was a very bad recession. And so there was a reaction against the economy, a reaction against foreign policy. And then there was also just generally a reaction to all that radical stuff that people are still thinking about in the 60s, uh, late 60s, early 70s. And Carter doesn't seem to have much of a, a, a position on that. So Reagan comes in with 
kind of as, as, as an antidote to all this. He came in with a very strong um, um, success, electoral success in 1980. When he's in office in 1984, he wins the election by an even greater success, bigger than what Nixon had had before. In fact, I actually remember the 84 election. Every single state except one went for Reagan. Every single state, 49 states went for Reagan. It was just as shockingly lopsided as you can. He really kind of turned around the image and the, uh, the, uh, the presence of, uh, of uh, the president. This is one of the reasons why conservatives all love Reagan. It's also obviously kind of one of the reasons why the liberals hate Reagan, because he was like the hero, and it was a huge shift in American um, uh, uh, um, political uh, alignment. Most people in the 80s were Republican. Most people were uh, Reaganites. And so that's why the liberals didn't like him. That's also, of course, why the conservatives do. And even today, we're looking at 30, 40 years, people on both sides of the party often will point to Reagan. So conservatives will say, I'm a Reagan conservative, and that's what I'm campaigning on. Liberals will sometimes say, I'm a Reagan Democrat, which means that I'm doing the things that Reagan would have done that was reaching over to the other side. And so both sides today look at him kind of in this uh, positive light, even though the radical and the liberals still don't like him at all. Okay, now let's shift out of that. That's kind of a political thing, but we have to talk about how this has an impact on the Cold War. I mentioned Reagan being kind of a change. He is a change not only from the uh, Carter, but he's also a change from Nixon. He's a change from Eisenhower. I made the mention that Eisenhower wasn't that different than FDR in terms of many of the policies. Well, Nixon had a different political uh, uh, foreign policy in the sense that he was able to end the Vietnam War using this triangulation against China, but on many other policies, he's not that different from even LBJ. He didn't end many of the um, Great Society uh, programs. So Reagan really represents this kind of a change. Sometimes they refer to it as a Reagan revolution. He has a change in domestic and foreign policies. I'm focusing mainly on the foreign policies. In order to understand how he is responsible for ending this war, you have to understand what it is that he does different than the presidents that came before him. Now, before we do this, I'm going to give you some terminology. And there's lots of acronyms, lots of initials here. And so I'm going to tell you what these initials are because they'll help you. I'm just going to go uh, at a time. ICBM, Intercontinental Ballistic Missile. IRBM, Intermediate Range Ballistic Missile. SLBM, uh, Submarine Launched Ballistic Missile, also short range. ABM, anti-ballistic missiles. These are the missiles that shoot out other missiles. MIRVs, multiple independently guided re-entry vehicles. These are a reaction to the ABMs. If you're gonna shoot a missile to hit another missile, then the best solution is to put like six missiles in that missile. Only one of them is gonna have a nuclear warhead. The other ones will be dummies, but they'll go all over. And if you're the guy who's being shot at, you don't know which one has a uh, uh, weapon, the warhead, and which one is a dummy. So you have to shoot every single one of them. The MIRV helps to make the ABM, at this point, somewhat obsolete. These are all acronyms. They're all types of weapons. The last thing that you need to know is this MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction. I'll talk about that in a second. We already mentioned it a little bit. Now, just a short history on nuclear weapons. After World War II, the, um, the United States had to decide whether they're going to put their military defenses into missiles or into someplace else. You may have recall, recalled, I didn't talk about it very much, but if you've read your textbook or if you've seen any History Channel uh, documentaries on this, uh, the Germans had missiles, were beginning to do missile technology during the war. It's called the V1 and the V2. The V1 was just like this 
I don't want to say a bottle rocket, but very much like a bottle rocket. It was huge, and it caused a lot of damage, but you had no guidance whatsoever. You just kind of aim it this way, and it shoots, and it lands somewhere. And so very useless in terms of an actual military. It scared people, but it didn't have any impact. A V-2, towards the very end of this war, was beginning to be a little bit better at guidance, but there was no way of guaranteeing that it's going to actually hit what you're going to hit. So at this time, in the 50s, a lot of these German scientists become American scientists. And we decide, are we going to go with a missile program? Are we going to go with uh, uh, using rockets for defense? Or are we going to do something else? And in the end, we decided we won't do missiles. In the 1950s, instead of missiles, we put our energy on aircraft carriers, really big aircraft carriers. And the benefit of a big aircraft carrier is that you can put it anywhere around the world and you can have bombers on the aircraft carrier and they can just fly off, drop the bomb, and fly back. That way you don't have to worry about guidance. You don't have to worry about making sure you hit where you're going to hit. That aircraft bomber will make sure it hits. And so that's where we uh, pursued for most of the 50s. Things changed in 1957 when the Soviets sent up this is a satellite, it's about the size of a big basketball, Sputnik. They sent the Sputnik into the atmosphere and it became the first satellite. It's not a nuclear weapon, it's nothing, it's basically a radio beacon. It goes beep, 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 nothing else. But the fact is, if you can put a satellite into orbit, that means that it can go around the world over and over again. If you can put it into orbit, you might be able to program it to come down from orbit. And suddenly we look at missiles in a completely new light. Sputnik caused the rocket program in the United States to be reinvigorated. It's after Sputnik that we decide we're going to start not only doing rockets, but we are going to think about going to the moon. And the space program looks like we're going to do it because we want to see the moon and touch the moon, but the main motivation behind the space program is that if we can safely bring people from the Earth to the moon and land them back up, then we can also safely, more or less, send up a missile, have it go outside the Earth's orbit, and land anywhere on the world. And so the space technology, the space race, was kind of a, a secondary impact on practicing and developing our long-range missile defense system. So it's after Sputnik that we start building ICBMs. In the early 60s, there are no intercontinental ballistic missiles. There aren't really too many intermediate range missiles. But we developed those first. Submarine launched missiles and intermediate uh, ballistic missiles are kind of being developed at the same time. It takes most of the 60s, about mid 60s, before we're able to develop this. And by the time we get to the mid 60s, they do have missiles in the United States, in Iowa, in California, in Alaska that can fly up and land and hit any point on Earth. But this is late. And as the United States is building this, of course, Soviet Union is building this. Now, that's just technology. One of the things that we have to look at in terms of the history is that there were some people that were very afraid of this missile technology. They weren't afraid as much because the Soviet Union is going to attack us. There were some people that were afraid that if we have this technology, the Soviet Union will be frightened into thinking that there's no way that they'll ever win, that this will be a first strike technology. In other words, we might be able to shoot this from far, far away, destroy the Soviet Union, and then we don't have any mutually assured destruction. And so there was kind of a policy, an attempt to try to make sure that we were all even. We deliberately look for evenness. Now, the Soviet Union was developing these missiles, but they were always lying about how many missiles they made. Remember, rule of might doesn't worry about honesty or being true to the law. They'll do whatever they need to do. So they might say, we're only developing a few hundred missiles, and they might have 10,000 in production. So the United States tried to come up with um, treaties, the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty, SALT. Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty was an attempt to limit the number of uh, missiles that both sides had so that they were both equal, which means that if they're both equal, then they would both have mutually assured destruction. That way, nobody would fight. And so we would have deterrence, continued deterrence. 
if we both know that both of us are pointing guns at each other, then we won't cross the line. And the weapons are these big guns. This is kind of a policy. And the thing is, is that it's not just a Republican policy. Republicans and Democrats supported this. This was an American policy to try to maintain equity. If the Soviets got too many weapons, then there was a risk that they would attack and then wipe all of our weapons out. And if they knew that, then there would be no cost. The cost of their war would be super low. Then they would win, and then they would come in. So we couldn't let them have this, this confidence that they could destroy all of our weapons before we even started. If they had that belief, then they might actually use it. So to prevent them from engaging in the war, we have to have equity, a balance. There has to be equality. But we don't need more than equality. If the Russians decide they have 10,000, all we need are about 1,500 with the multiple entry rear, uh, uh, MERV uh, warheads, and that would have the equivalent of like 10,000 actual targets. And so that would be enough to guarantee that if the Soviets launched, we would want launch and they would be destroyed. And if they know that they would be destroyed if they launched, they won't launch. It's the theory behind mutually assured destruction nuclear deterrence. There's a downside of mutual assured destruction, and it's not the type of downside that you might think of. The typical Hollywood downside is that you've got two people pointing guns at each other, and if they just keep increasing the number of guns, and there's tons of guns on one side, and there's tons of guns on the other side, that someone's going to get twitchy, they're going to get sweaty, they're going to get nervous, they're going to do whatever, some crazy person is going to shoot, and then boom, everybody dies. If you've ever watched the movie uh, uh, Dr. Strangelove, 1962, that's the whole point of the theory of the movie. It's a comedy, dark comedy, but some crazy person decides that he's going to shoot first, and this is going to create a world war. Many movies <laughs> came out about this. Well, Reagan understands this, but Reagan also says that there's another dark side. It's not so much the fear that we have all these weapons, because the fact of the matter is both the Russians and the Americans are pretty safeguarded. They know about the nuclear deterrence, and so it's not enough, it's not going to be enough to have one crazy person to start the war. He's not really worried about that starting the war so much as he's worried about the fact that there's no end to it. If you've got two people pointing guns at each other, there's no way to end it. You can't end it if you make sure that one side has two guns and the other side has two guns. The only way to ever end it is if instead of one guy having only two and the other two, Maybe one guy has 150 guns with 150 people on his side all pointing at the one guy with two guns. That would end it. And so Reagan gets rid of the idea of mutually assured destruction as a policy. He does not want equity. If you keep a balance, then you can keep that balance forever. The Cold War has already been 40 years. He doesn't want it another 40 years. I remember being in high school in the 1980s, and I remember my um, uh, world history teacher asked me, it's like 1984, 1985, saying, do you think the Cold War will ever end? And I remember most of the people in the uh, classroom, myself included, said, no, nope, it's just the way it is. It will always be this way. 60 years from now, we'll be in a Cold War. Because it's hard to envision how you could possibly end it. Well, Reagan had a policy change. The shift, it was a two-pronged strategy. One-pronged strategy was to end mutually assured destruction. What that meant is that to end the balance. I'm going to go back here to the um, uh, board, and I'll let you see what I'm writing here. Give me a second. The fact of the matter is, is that the U.S. and our allies versus the Soviets and their satellites were not equal. The U.S. has a free market, and the Soviets have a communist market. 
And what that means, it's called a command economy. They don't allow free enterprise, they don't allow supply and demand, so they actually decide what's going to be made when it needs to be made. As a result, the economy was just significantly lower, not by 10%, not by 20%, but something closer to 85% lower, less. The American economy was just staggeringly large, mainly because it's a free market. The United States doesn't tell you what to invent. You invent because there's people that are willing to buy it. And so the economy was huge. What that meant in plain language in terms of military is that the United States spent roughly 4% of its gross national product on the military. 4%. I know we get this idea that we spend gobs and gobs of money, but even today, that number isn't that much different. We spend today more on social security, on, on certain uh, social welfare programs, on education than we spend on the military. But 4% of a huge economy is a huge number. And in fact, that number equals to about 50% of the Soviet GMP, 50% of its military, because they were doing an equal, they would spend as much money as we did, but because their economy is weaker, that same amount of money was half of their gross national product, keeping in mind that they also are a police state, so these satellites are forced. You don't, it's not willing, uh, um, Georgia isn't wanting to be under the Soviet Union. The Ukraine isn't wanting to be under the Soviet Union. They are forced. Eastern Germany doesn't want to be under the Soviet Union. So that means that the military has to, the Soviet Union has to have military in all these locations with people with guns, and they have to be willing to use them. That's a huge expense. About 50% of their gross national product went to the military. So Reagan came up with this idea. If we double our military output, that will put us only at 8%, which isn't that much. But if we double it, the Soviets are going to want to match it. And what happens if they double it? They can't. They can't spend 100% of their GMP. It's just too much. So this is the first prong. The United States immediately doubled the budget from 171 billion to 300 billion. From 171 billion to 300 billion. And the United States could do this, and it was still only 8%. For the Soviets to match, it was going to bankrupt them. At first, the Soviets tried it. So from around 1980, about 1980 to around 1985, the Soviets kept trying to kind of be at par, and it was getting more and more expensive. And so they weren't able to budget it. The thing is, is that that wasn't the only way the United States was pushing this. If it was only military, there's always a risk that in acts of desperation, you might do something drastic. If you've got these two people, and they've got two guns facing each other, and this other guy suddenly gets a friend, and another friend, and another friend, and another friend, and a whole bunch of friends, and they're all pointing at him, the guy might say, you know what? I'm going to die anyway. Let's go ahead and fire. And so that's a risk. So Reagan had a two-prong attack. The first prong was we're going to end mutually assured destruction. In other words, we're going to end that balancing. We're just going to spend twice as much, and then it'll be unequal. But at the same time, instead of just uh, attacking them or facing them with that, we're going to give them an out. We're going to constantly be saying, you don't have to do this. I'll put all my weapons away if you put all your weapons away. We can completely end this if you just agree to step down. If you just stop what you're doing, we will end all of our uh, weapons. We'll, we'll get rid of large classes of weapons. So it was a two-prong attack. The first one was to double the GMP, and the second prong was to come and have very strong negotiations. This INF treaty means 
we would get rid of all intermediate nuclear weapons. START treaty, treaty, strategic arms reduction treaty. Not a limitation where we'll come up to this cap, but the exact opposite. We'll reduce everything down on both sides to very little. This is beginning to de-escalate. And Reagan knew that the Soviets could not support this. So after a while, they would have to come to the negotiating table. And in fact, they did. And Gorbachev is the guy who ends up being the Soviet leader sent to go out and be the one who's going to start negotiating. And it was called glasnost. It's called uh, a thaw in the Cold War. And he came to the strategic, uh, to the uh, bargaining table. And as a result of this, um, we came up with a bunch of treaties that significantly reduced the number of weapons that we were creating. The problem is, is that the Soviet Union had already tried for too long with this. And so they were unable to dig themselves out of the hole that they created. And so they were flat going bankrupt. Not only internally, but they could not support all these satellites that are all over the world. And so the very first satellite, the most expensive one, the biggest one that they began to get rid of is in Eastern Europe, in the Eastern, around by where uh, Ukraine is, around by where Georgia is, they removed some of the guards that were preventing the Soviets from escaping. And so there was news coverage of just thousands of people going through these gates. Nobody's doing anything about it. And then within a month, they pulled the guards from the wall around Berlin Wall. The wall that had been surrounding West Berlin, that was in East Berlin, they, they removed the guards, which meant that there's nothing keeping the West Berlin in, and there's also nothing keeping the East Germans from going into the West. When that happened, and I remember it happened, it happened at the day, they didn't, there was no announcement, there was nothing. In the morning, people realized that there's no guards there. And throughout the day, they couldn't believe it. They went up there, and people started going back and forth through the gate, and there was nobody there. And they proved there's nothing there. And by the end of that night, people were actually going back home, taking um, sledgehammers and tearing down the wall. And that's what this picture is, tearing down the wall. Reagan, prior to this, about three or four years, said, Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Well, by the time we get to the end of the Cold War, the people are actually tearing down the wall. This is 18, 1989. Uh, the Soviet Union basically retreats as far back as it can because it cannot support the military all over the, uh, in the satellites. Within two years, the internal bankruptcy is so high that Gorbachev is overthrown. A guy named Yuri, uh, not Yuri, um, Vladimir, not Vladimir Putin. Um, oh, his brain's going to forgive me. I'll forget what it is. It'll come to me. Uh, Boris Yeltsin. Boris Yeltsin comes in and overthrows the communists, and Boris Yeltsin basically ends the Soviet Union. When the Soviet Union is ended, then the Ukraine becomes a new country, Georgia is a country, all these satellites are now independent country. There's another year or so of different revolutions and whatnot, but for the most part, Soviet Union is gone, and when the Soviet Union is gone, the Cold War ends. Now, here's a question. And I think I mentioned this before. The Cold War ends. Whoopsie. You guys are looking at my part there, not at the... The Cold War ends. Lasts more than 40 years. If the Cold War was simply the U.S. and allies, France and England, against Soviet and the satellites, then clearly when the Soviet Union collapses and goes back to Russia and Ukraine and all these other little countries, independent countries, when that happens, then there's no Cold War. Except, the Cold War is not only between the US, England, and France, and the Soviet Union. The Cold War was also, always, between rule of law versus the rule of might. When the Soviet Union collapsed, um, Boris Yeltsin tried to create kind of a democratic government, but the Soviet Union had never actually had a democracy. 
It had a huge black market. It had a big um, kind of a mafia, criminal underground. It was very difficult for it to restore order. But it was in that direction. Putin is now following kind of in that same path. Is not a democracy, but it's in, in that direction. They're not communists, but they're not democracies. They're, they're still more or less a dictatorship. When the Soviet Union collapsed, the obvious focus of the Cold War ended. But the conflict between rule of law and rule of might is still present. And so we had a very interesting thing in American history, and I'm not going to go into the details because I'd like to end at about 1990. 91 when the Soviet Union collapses, but throughout the 90s, about a decade, the United States figured the Cold War is over, so we focused on domestic policies. That's why Bill Clinton was elected in 92, because he didn't spend any attention on the foreign policy. We didn't talk about wars or anything like that, nothing about the Cold War that was over. We were talking about social welfare and what to do with how to do domestic policy. And for about 10 years, the United States didn't think about it at all. Until right towards the end of Clinton's presidency, there was an attempt to blow up the Trade Center. It failed. There was an attempt to blow up, um, in fact, a successful attempt to blow up part of an embassy in Africa. There was a couple of attacks. We began to see this kind of rise in terrorism. And then, as you all know, two years later, 9-11, 2001, we have this massive attack, blow up the Trade Center, attack on the Pentagon, and then we realize that the rule of law may have won against the Soviet Union, but it doesn't mean that the rule by might has disappeared. And so since 2001, 9-11, the United States continues to be in a Cold War. The difference is, is that the target isn't the Soviet Union and its allies, its satellites. It's against terrorism and those that are explicitly trying to undermine the rule of law through the threat of fear and, and basically terrorist acts. And that's where our Cold War has shifted into. And you could say that that's what's been going on the last 18 years at the very least. That's the end of our story. I don't like to go into details the last 20 years because the last 20 years would be my memory. Your memory is just as good. You can look up newspapers for that. We don't have access to presidential papers. We don't have access to a lot of the things that we need to really understand this. And so I'm not going to give you just my opinion on these things. I like to stop the war uh, history right at the point where historians can honestly stop. So into the Cold War in 1991. But we have a little bit of an overview where the 90s is focused primarily on domestic issues. After 9-11, we focused primarily on foreign policy issues. I would argue that probably Obama, what makes Obama um, uh, 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 will be remembered, is that he was an attempt to go back to domestic policies and kind of forego the foreign policy side. And so we'll see how this ends up. We don't know what the end of the war on terror is because we're in the middle of it. Give us 60 years, we'll be able to look back at this, we'll have a much better insight. But right now, we're in the middle of the process of it, it's kind of up in the air. You guys, your tasks for your exam, if you haven't looked at it, is you're going to ask yourselves, which is more influential, domestic policies or foreign policies? And we've talked about both of these here. We talked about the Civil Rights Movement. We talked about the Great Society. We also talked about the end of the Cold War. Just because we end on the Cold War doesn't mean that foreign policy is automatically the superior choice. Just like when we were talking in the last unit between Great Depression and World War II, we ended on World War II, but that doesn't mean that that's necessarily the right choice. Either one of these options can be an acceptable argument. There's no wrong answer here. You're going to have to make an argument using your evidence to find out what is the um, um, best answer that you can uh, defend with your logic and with your evidence. And it could be either one, there's no problem on it. So we'll talk about this on Wednesday. That's our last class, I'll give you the study guide. This is our last lecture, so this is what you're gonna do. And um, a Daisy is reminding me that you have to have a study guide question, and this will be my study guide question. 
This is the, uh, not the city guide question, the daily quiz question. So you have to write this up and put it on my red chair in my office. The door will be open. Okay, and this is the last daily quiz. And this is what I want you to write. Question, is the Cold War over? Answer. Well, I'll let you give me your answer. And I'll take a look at it. Good luck. If you guys have any questions, come and see me. I will be here until about noon on Monday, and then I have to run off into Milwaukee. Otherwise, I will be here on Tuesday and on Wednesday. And then, of course, our final is on Friday, I believe. Otherwise, good luck. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, words, or wisdom, let me know. Otherwise, we will see you on Wednesday or before. Take care. Does that make